Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 13th talk uh, in this series organized by the University of Buckingham. We have over a thousand people already listening in to a man who is a complete genius at being at uh, the right place at the right time in Berlin uh, as the Berlin Wall was crashing, in Moscow as the Soviet Union was falling apart. Uh, political correspondent, chief political co correspondent for the Financial Times, uh, Newsnight, the Today programme, editor of the New Statesman between 2005 and 2008, author of wonderful books, including one behind your left ear, John. And we're going to begin. We've had some wonderful writers uh, uh, talking, Philip Pullman, uh, William Boyd, and Michael Morpurgo, uh, who uh, who have been talking about their uh, rooms, including uh, uh, we had Christina Lamb, um, who actually moved rooms uh, midway through her talk. John, what is uh, this saying about you, the room behind you? Well, first of all, good evening to you, Anthony. It's always a great pleasure. Good evening um, to our audience, um, and it's it's a great pleasure to be here and I was delighted to take up Anthony's offer. I hope it's not an unlucky 13th that I am uh, and I will do my best um, to keep you hopefully entertained and informed and talking of which that was the um, the great mission the great Rethian mission of the BBC um, to educate and inform and I was uh, recently doing a, a two-way uh, discussion on the BBC and behind me as Anthony has already alluded there's a, a poster which wasn't put up um, uh, deliberately for the occasion. I've actually had it for years. It was on the tube and much bigger ones uh, for a book I wrote uh, back in the end of 2003, uh, Blair's Wars, which looked at uh, his five wars in the first six years of his office. And um, it was a rather colourful paperback uh, cover, which originally I recoiled at, but then I really enjoyed. So this, this is my study. The last two years I've been back, I've probably done about a third of my career um, as a freelancer, self-employed and two thirds uh, working for good old institutions. Um, and so this is a uh, home office. And for me, mercifully, um, uh, unlike others, uh, lockdown has not been a, a terrible dislocation because certainly in terms of work patterns, combination of excitement and precariousness um, have followed me uh, frequently through. And indeed, it's a great thing about online. I mean, clearly, John, with or much sooner, uh, all 1,200 of us uh, be gathering in the uh, Vincent Theatre here at Buckingham to hear you uh, talk if we could all fit in. But, you know, one of the benefits of an online literary festival is that you can see the writer very close up, which you couldn't if you were in the back row or close to the back, but also you can see the writer in their lair uh, where they uh, do their uh, their work. Now, John is going to begin with maybe 25 minutes talking uh, not the least about the subject of his uh, Radio 4 analysis programme, which he presented last week on COVID and what is COVID going to do for the politi political uh, legitimacy and style of governments worldwide? So, uh, John, over to you, and then I'll ask a few questions and then over to the audience. Can I say to everybody, particularly if you're new, do get the questions in, uh, get them in as early as possible, and do put your name, and I'll mention your name, uh, and if there's any affiliation uh, there. Um, John, on we go, take it away. Thank you, Anthony. And um, once again, hello, everybody. This is a combination of prepared uh, remarks culled largely from the analysis programme, which, if you haven't heard already, is available on BBC Sounds and all good podcasts, etc., etc. Um, so part of it is um, a red disposition and part of it uh, a deposition and part of it is um, I will extemporise as well. So in times of emergency, in whom do we trust? And that's a question uh, I was pondering, and I've been pondering throughout lockdown, and which I posed and hopefully began to answer in the analysis program that Anthony has mentioned. It was called the smack of firm leadership. And this evening, I'll talk about that based on the program, but I'll range more widely to 
And of course, um, I'll be happy to discuss any related issues or unrelated issues uh, in discussion with you all. So for the programme, I was looking at rival political systems and what the pandemic uh, says about their future. Are authoritarians increasing in confidence? Are populists a spent force? Has liberal democracy, already not in great nick, been damaged yet further? So for this programme, I, I was joined by an amazing array of contributors. With me was Francis Fukuyama, the man who 30 years ago famously declared the end of history and the victory of Western liberal democracy. There was Kishore Mabubani, a very uh, different type of contributor. He is Singapore's most famous public intellectual who has made a career out of telling the world that Western hegemony is over. Anne Applebaum is a staff writer at The Atlantic, I'm sure known to you all, an author of a forthcoming book entitled The Twilight of Democracy, which um, I've reviewed for The Guardian, um, and that comes out shortly. Misha Glenny has written Mafia, um, an anthology of uh, organised crime, uh, uh, which was turned into famously TV pro uh, TV series. He's written about cybercrime, Brazil and organised crime, and much more besides, very much the dark side of international affairs. Lionel Barber, the ex-editor of the FT, who's thought a lot about all of these issues of political systems, with a particular recent focus on issues around surveillance, privacy and data. Ivan Krastyev, um, fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna, and he spent the first half of his life uh, under communism in his native Bulgaria, and he really has become one of the great public intellectuals of uh, uh, Central Europe. Um, and Constanze Stelzenmüller. Now, if you have never come across her, you really should. She is a force of nature. She's now at the Brookings uh, Institution in New York, uh, in Washington, uh, and she's really one of the key figures in German foreign policy. All of them coalesced around three components that I think we can use to determine the success or otherwise of countries and systems, ways of dealing uh, with coronavirus. Number one, social trust. That's public confidence in the state's ability to keep its promises, to deliver on its promises, to play by the rules. That's previously been uh, termed the social contract. Number two is the capacity of the state, resources, national wealth, long termism, planning, investment in public services. And then there is competence. And I will focus largely on that uh, in, in these remarks. And I certainly did that in my programme. Francis Fukuyama said, it takes a crisis like the one we're in to make people realise that the basic functions of government are actually pretty important. And having a government that can actually make the bureaucracy work and deliver services is vital. Anne Applebaum said, one of the most interesting things about COVID-19 is that the responses to it have not broken down along the lines of democracy versus autocracy. I'll come back to both of those points. But first, I'll start with the hybrid, the populists. At the risk of simplifying, only one uh, that has displayed a measure of competence has been Hungary. Viktor Orban is a leader that, who is unseemly in so many ways. He has exploited the early stages of the pandemic to continue along the, ro the route he has gone down uh, in several uh, terms of office now to crack down yet further on the media and other democratic safeguards like the judiciary. Yet Hungary is still a member of the EU and always manages to get away with it. It still notionally observes the norms that we in the West recognise. So that's him. Now, what do Jair Bolsonaro, Donald Trump and Boris Johnson have in common? They're very good campaigners. What they haven't been doing is governing. They have presided over the most chaotic responses to COVID and the highest death tolls are a pretty simple and unambiguous way of testing that. What distinguishes these leaders, these Churchill wannabes with their bombast and bluster, is that they came to power precisely because they didn't attempt to unite their societies, to be all things to all people. 
Instead, they identified the fears of a significant part of the population, their base, and harnessed those fears in a culture war against the other. They are hostile to expertise. Michael Gove, um, you know that what he said. They equate expertise to the elites, always forgetting that they're very much a part of that elite that they so disparage. They are averse to complexity and detail. They thrive on supposed heroic gestures um, and they thrive and depend on simple them and us narratives. They struggle with invisible enemies. There's a fascinating difference between fear and anxiety in contemporary politics. And Ivan Krastyev uh, developed this point. The populists have thrived on pre-existing, uh, but also generated anxiety. It is a type of fear, but it is much more diffuse. I'm losing my job. My access to health, education, housing is being undermined by migrants, whether that's real or imagined or uh, stoked, doesn't matter. That is my fear. Globalization and the elite is to blame. My sense of belonging is undermined. This is identity politics. COVID-19 did not produce such anxiety. Instead, it produced a classical state of fear. Like in a horror movie, you know very well what you fear, even if you can't see it. In this case, you fear being infected. You fear ending up in hospital. You fear dying or someone close to you dying and you can't even give them a dignified funeral. You're looking for somebody to protect you. So who should we turn to instead if we cannot rely on the populace? Which system both protects us from the initial visceral fear and enables us or helps us to recover? We know I would contend which one doesn't. So now let's look at, for example, South Korea, Taiwan, New Zealand, Finland, Germany, poster boys, or should I say poster girls, of the coronavirus response. When I mentioned to Constanze Stolzenmüller that these countries were all run by women, and was there anything to deduce from that, she put me firmly in my place with a firm no. And I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on that. So if it is not that, what do these leaders, what do these countries, what do these systems have in common? Now, some of these leaders, some of the most competent ones, had medical or science background. And the name Angela Merkel springs immediately to mind. But before talking a little bit more about her, and her personality and her character and her leadership style. It's worth noting that she's not operating in a vacuum. She is a product of her system, one that prizes reliability over bombast, just as Boris Johnson is a product of ours, which does the reverse. A year and a half ago, I um, came up with an idea for a book and the title and um, I will start plugging it now. Uh, it comes out at the end of August and it is called Why the Germans Do It Better. And the subtitle is Notes from a Grown-Up Country. Now, when I went back to Berlin throughout 2019, did a host of interviews, with politicians, business leaders, friends who are social workers, random people I met, uh, you name it, across the board, I talked to them. The one thing they all reacted in the same way. They either laughed or they shrieked when I told them the title and the subtitle. You can't write that, they said. I said, I could, I would, and I have. And I look in the book at Germany's political culture, its economic system, its social consensus, ranging across all aspects from defence and foreign policy, uh, econo uh, economics, um, uh, equality issues, environment, culture, tech. I look across all of it and I also juxtapose it to other countries, not least uh, our own. And for all the many positives, there is always a negative. Uh, the German phrase, which is langsam aber sicher, which means slow but sure. 
for this sense of reliability to work, Germany is incredibly, as I'm sure you all know, rules based uh, to, the, to the point where it absolutely drives you mad. It is risk averse. It is slow to change. And yet every time it's written off as the sick man of Europe, every time we indul indulge in that German word, schadenfreude, they seem to rise to the occasion. Now ask yourself, look at the two big moments in German history of the last 30 years. The fall of the wall and the assimilation of a deeply impoverished and traumatized uh, country in the East, the GDR, into a wider country. And for all the problems, and I document them and I know the GDR reasonably well, I defy you to imagine what other country could have done that. Certainly not Britain. We can barely run ourselves on a day to day basis, let alone absorb a country of 18 million people with so many problems. Secondly, was Angela Merkel's decision in 2015 to absorb one million deeply traumatized and impoverished and destitute refugees and asylum seekers and migrants from the Maghreb, from Africa, uh, from Syria, from Afghanistan and elsewhere. People that had made the trek on dangerous boats and on foot all the way through Southeastern Europe being uh, shouted at, being uh, harassed, being uh, caged by the Hungarians and others. She said, no, let them in. The welcome was extraordinary, notwithstanding the, 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 the backlash, the AFD problem, which happy to discuss all of that. The um, extent to which that journalism, my old trade, we love to focus on difficulties, on problems, as we always should, as a bulwark for, for democracy and for accountability. But the successes in that assimilation are as remarkable, I would contend more remarkable, than the difficulties and the failure. Could we have done that, any of this, with our political culture? Go back to those three terms I've used in this programme, social trust, capacity and competence. Merkel is somebody I met in 1990. She was a junior advisor. We were having coffee in the old Volkskammer, which was all, we didn't realise at the time, it was all covered in asbestos. Uh, that was in, in 1990. I had no idea then uh, what a remarkable politician um, she would uh, become. Helmut Kohl, to his great credit, did recognise that. She's not a fan of soundbite culture, uh, but on this occasion, and people thought she was washed up, they were looking forward to the end of Merkel um, so that Germany could be re-energised, but she has risen to the occasion. She's proved herself, perhaps in a surprise to herself, to be an effective communicator, authentic, credible, fact-based. She says what she knows, no matter how painful it is for the audience, and she says what she doesn't know. Competence is essential, but more than that, I would argue, so is empathy. The fact that she grew up in the GDR under communist rule, longing to, to see and to be able to travel across the West, also shaped her in ways that made it very clear to her that the constitutional and democratic order that the Germans have, that we have, is precious. It's not something that we ought to throw away lightly. She talked about sacrifices, closing borders, which is anathema to Germans and to many Europeans. Track and trace, think of the aversion that they have to all forms of data collection uh, arisen from uh, time under the Nazis and the Stasi in the East. For years, we've been handing over our data to authorities, public and, and private. And this is a bigger, broader question, happy to discuss. After 9-11, we accepted more surveillance to keep terrorists at bay. Rights taken away are rarely given back. So now during the pandemic, we've gone further. We've allowed ourselves to be locked up, to have our movements monitored. And unlike others who are more complacent, she doesn't take those uh, for granted. Freedom is not just an aspiration. It's not a way of life and it's not a piece of showboating. It's also about rules and structures, good ones, that is. Perhaps you value things only when you know what it's like not to have them. These questions of surveillance, risk assessment and liberty are incredibly difficult to manage, and yet they're already being reduced to simple binaries by political extremes uh, in this emergency. Just look at the rise of the anti-vaxxer movement in the United States, Americans taking up arms to demonstrate in, in state legislatures. This is going to be a fight, and one of the fights will coalesce 
about how we return to work, how we rebuild societies. COVID is now ex accelerating the ideological battle between left and right, and also those hoping for a restoration of rational policy decision making. It's revealing and reinforcing the strengths and weaknesses of different political systems. Today's superpowers, the US and China, are using the pandemic to denounce each other's competence and honesty. It's accelerating the ideological battle, and it's given certain re regimes cover. From Hungary to Algeria, Lebanon to Chile, governments are citing the pandemic to clamp down on protest and media. China has made its move on Hong Kong. At the latest count, at least 60 countries have postponed elections since February. How many will take place anytime soon and under what conditions? One person's legitimate reason to deal with an emergency is another's power, is another's power grab. So which brings me more directly in conclusion onto the authoritarians. A decade or so ago, I spent time at the Lee Kuan Yew School of, of Political Studies uh, at the National University of Singapore. That's where Ke Kishore Mababani teaches. I was looking at the Singapore model, the pact between citizen and state, basic freedoms given up voluntarily in return for prosperity and security. I wrote that in a book uh, called Freedom for Sale. I've long argued that 21st century authoritarians differ from 20th century dictators. They're much, much more clever. They don't seek to control in every element of everyone's life. They differentiate between private freedoms. You have your freedom to educate your children, to travel, to wear the clothes that you want to do, to do whatever you want to do in your private realm, as long as you don't occupy my ground, the public realm public freedoms are out of bounds. So China, after its slow start, used draconian measures to crack down on COVID. <clears throat> it's since then mounted a relentless PR campaign to show that it's helping the hapless West and it uh, juxtaposes how it's doing with the sad pictures of refrigerator trucks on street corners in New York. The Chinese government and the Chinese people are genuinely horrified at how badly uh, the US has been handling COVID and what really angers them is then being seen to be subjected to a blame game uh, be only because the American authorities want to hide their own their own failures. And I agree with that assessment. Yet their, their record was hardly a spectacular success. They punished whistleblowers. Uh, Dr. Li Wenliang, as you all know, became famous for trying to blow the whistle and was then silenced and subsequently died of the disease. Um, that's a problem that would only incur occur in that kind of authoritarian system where ordinary people on the on the ground are afraid to report bad news up to their leaders. Transparency, the lack of it, that is the big negative of authoritarian regimes in dealing with emergencies. And yet they do have one advantage, big advantage. It is simply state power to mobilise, to get things done. So on this balance sheet, if authoritarian states can deal with with all the pluses and minuses with emergencies competently as competently if not perhaps more competently than democratic state what states what fundamentally when you reduce it all down is the difference history is full of the stories of democracies that have fallen apart starting with the most famous the original death of democracy in ancient rome which is the one that the the, the writers of the american constitution studied over and again over and again and argued about they read their cicero they tried to write a constitution that would prevent that from happening. Most democracies are short lived. The complacency that we have come to about democracy in the last 60, 70 years is misplaced and it's self defeating. We have forgotten our Roman history. We've forgotten our 19th century history, 20th century history, all of which tell us that democracies do get overthrown. They fail and ours can too. And yet in adversity, something else might be happening. I just wonder, have the populists been put back in their box? Or are they biding their time, waiting for unemployment to surge and anger to rise? You can bet they're not going to disappear quietly. And you can bet that the road from now to the American elections and after is going to be extremely turbulent. The fears produced by COVID may yet galvanize people in other countries to embrace steady as she goes mainstream politics again and to treasure attributes they seem to have tired of. So just let me leave you with these thoughts. Does competence equate with centrism, with technocracy? 
did the politics of social democracy, Christian democracy, New Labour, One Nation, Conservatism disappear for good? They were denounced as hollowed out, empty, standing for nothing, inauthentic. Or turn the question around, can competence live with risk-taking radicalism, a politics that's work, that works and is pragmatic, but that does not always have to trim? That is one of the big questions that arises from this pandemic. Western democratic elites have taken the, initial, the essential rightness of the way things are ordered for granted and have failed to invest in stability and resilience. And that is a vulnerability that the populists have taken advantage of. Maybe we are coming to realize that we need to reinvest in democratic structures and in the state and in public services rather than discarding them. A moment of enlightenment and encouragement, who knows? Does coronavirus really offer the chance of a fight back for democracy? The immediate prospects with all the economic mayhem and possible social strife to come don't look good. But if we learn the lessons, if we invest in the public good and our democratic in institutions, if we become less complacent and if we prioritise competence, I would, Anthony, argue that there is always a chance. Thank you very much indeed, John. Um, really um, excellent. And do have the questions, uh, please, coming through. Uh, well over, well, enormous uh, numbers um, uh, are listening to this. Questions, if you could make them, please, quite brief, uh, rather than a statement, then it's easier for me uh, to say them. I'm going to just I'm going to be talking to you about some of your experiences, but I'm just going to pop a question straight in from Mark, who says, what are the top three things, John, that you would like the UK to adopt that Germany is doing better? Um, well, um, uh, in response well, to coronavirus. In response, right. On the specifics of, uh, gosh, where, where does one begin? I mean, there is hardly the only, I would reverse it and say, the only area of policy making and policy response, and goodness knows, hands up, this is extremely difficult for every country. This isn't wise after the event, no it allism at all. I'm simply comparing roughly equivalent systems uh, and everyone will make mistakes. Um, in specific terms, to reverse it, the only thing I would say that we have that really has been an unashamed success has been the furlough scheme, the job retention scheme that has staved off. It has certainly not eliminated, one might argue, it simply shunted forward by three to six months, what may be the inevitable, but it staved off an economic collapse. It did so quickly, it did so efficiently that one could argue gripes about uh, the self-employed and all kinds of other questions of detail. But to Rishi Sunak and to the others who did it, I think that was um, remarkable on all other areas. Um, in the, we, we have been found wanting. In the 2015 Strategic uh, Defence and Security Review, a pandemic or a global health emergency was listed, this is the British one, was listed as one of the five dangers to watch in the subsequent five years. This isn't some great act of soothsaying. It was there and it was talked about that we all know about SARS and the other uh, pandemics that had taken place. And as we know, uh, across the piece in terms of uh, the procurement of uh, vital equipment, whether it was lines of responsibility and this patchwork that we have in the NHS, in the NHS of, of institutions, uh, whether um, it was a, a more general failure to invest. We have very much always had in health terms, and I'm no health expert, uh, but when one does compare it to Germany, they always allowed for capacity in hospitals. We always, our, our bean counters in the NHS always had a, a, a sort of get somebody in for four hours, clear them out, you can get somebody else in, and this was regarded as hyper efficient. Actually, Germany built in slack into the system saying, well, it's almost like the sort of saving for a rainy day um, approach uh, to life. Uh, and so that meant that in the early stages, there were fewer concerns about capacity in the health service. The track and trace system that they have produced 
and the technology they have produced has been eminently more um, successful. This is a country that invests hugely in engineering, in science, in technology, and has some of the most cutting edge uh, health technology which it exports around the world. And uh, I think all countries will be looking, not, such, not just to Germany, but to other countries, um, for that kind of capacity building in the future. Uh, would, question, uh, would Theresa May have done better, a, a female, so she's fitting uh, that stereotype, or even Margaret Thatcher, well known in this university, John, who was a scientist uh, trained to boot? You're one of those great, that'll be, that'll be a wonderful um, counterfactual um, history question for uh, anybody to, uh, at school or university, to answer. At the risk of sounding glib, I struggle to think of a prime minister who could have been less suited for this moment than Boris Johnson. Tell us about that. That might, in, so therefore, by extension, the answer must surely be yes and yes to Theresa May and Margaret Thatcher, simply because the bar is set so incredibly low. It's partly his personality, which is a classic, and I know from experience, a sort of journalistic winging it approach to life. Oh, I can knock off a piece in half an hour, and as long as it's colourful and whimsical, I'll get away with it. And that has always been his approach to his uh, sense of responsibilities. I knew him when we were at the Telegraph together and all the stories of him uh, making up stories and playing fast and loose with the truth sadly happened to be true. I never bought shares in him. I never saw the great um, charisma or essential brilliance of the man. I just saw somebody who thought a lot of himself and thought he could get away with it. Um, and so that was his character. And as I hope in my uh, summary before, there is an issue with the notion of populist leaders who, whose job it was to um, kick up the dust, uh, kick up the dirt so that the dust would, would fly and creative tension would ensue from it in order to change society, cause mayhem, cause aggravation so that your base will feel energized. That has absolutely been Donald Trump's way, that has been Bolsonaro's way and others' way. In a more, um, how can I put it, in a more joking, clownish way, that has also been Johnson's way. It is not the thorough, dependable leader um, that is required in state. In, in, and the fact that he invokes Churchill, I always think is one of the great, I, I defer to all the many uh, students and scholars of Churchill who have greater knowledge than me, but the idea that, uh, that Churchill is, is some sort of lodestar for our present uh, prime minister is um, uh, bizarre. Uh, let's uh, pick up a question from Anne and uh, says, uh, do you think being in Berlin when the wall fell was the greatest moment uh, in your uh, career? How did you manage that? What was it like? Did well, you pick I, up a bit of a wall as a souvenir? I do. Actually. And John, for, for young, for students there, they might you might just explain the significance of uh, bits of the brick and mortar from the wall. No, I do actually have um, have some uh, actually in my mantelpiece in uh, in the hallway just behind my um, my study, which um, actually I gave to my parents, and then my mother passed away in January, so I I I, I took it back. Um, uh, I talk about <clears throat> great moments in history and and bathos. My um, my biggest concern was finding a phone line to file my story, um, and I rushed over uh, Checkpoint Charlie. Um, I was based in the East, by the way, not in the, in the West. And uh, I rushed over Checkpoint Charlie um, and begged a man in a, in a, um, in a, this was before the days, dear younger audience of mobile phones, uh, uh, begged a man in a kebab shop, a Turkish man, to lend me his phone, his landline, so I could do a reverse charge call to London and just spent an hour just um, dictating it uh, uh, off the top of my head. Uh, to uh, what was called a copy taker in those days, people who just literally dictated the, the ramblings of overexcited correspondents such as myself. Um, and yeah, I mean, sadly, I, I was only, gosh, how, how old was I? I was 28 at the time, I think, and 
I, I do remember saying to myself a few days later that this is a potential problem because once you've lived through something extraordinary like that, everything is downhill um, uh, from there. And uh, uh, it was it was an immense moment. And it was one of those moments that you knew uh, was sometimes with these great historic moments, you don't appreciate them for what they were. This you did. This was the unraveling of uh, 45 at the time years of uh, not just history, but of the foundations around which we all, West and East, lived. And to be in the epicentre of it uh, was extraordinary. And historians always look back and point to, with complete uh, integrity, the inevitability, the erosion of the GDR, the, the implosion of the economy, the contradictions at the heart of it, uh, Gorbachev sort of giving a sort of tacit green light. All of that was true. All I can say was living there in the East at the time, it did not feel, oh, it's just a matter of days before the wall comes down. It absolutely didn't. I was much more of a view uh, furnished by remarks from various members of the Politburo, the East German communist leadership at the time, that it was going to embark on a Chinese solution uh, uh, similar to Tiananmen Square, which had happened only a few months earlier, which the East German Communist Party hugely praised. Uh, and I really feared that something awful would happen. And the fact that those borders uh, by accident, and we, I think uh, I'm happy to tell the story of the press conference and everything else, but I think it's known, um, but that the opening happened by accident on the night and the border guards did let people through and nobody died uh, is again one of the great feats of history. Some will know, but many won't. So just retreat sure. at that event. So it was a time of terrible, of, of great turbulence. Uh, dissent was rising. East Germans were leaving in their in droves, in tens of thousands, either by, by driving a very circumlocutory route uh, through uh, Czechoslovakia, as it was then, into Hungary. And then you could go out of Hungary into Austria, and then you could get from Austria back into West Germany. Uh, into West Germany. So you could actually leave East Germany by an incredibly long route. And lots of people were doing it. Some were um, had basically crashed into the uh, German embassy in Prague and refusing to leave until they were uh, sent out as they as they were and they were allowed to go to West Germany. So the country was beginning to hemorrhage its people, just as it was in the late 1950s and early 1960s, which led to the building of the wall in the first place. So things were clearly going to happen. We thought they might relax the some the, the visa restrictions uh, that made it very, very difficult for East Germans to go to the West unless they were at retirement age, at which point they had no more uh, economic utility and were allowed to go. We thought reforms would happen. But the idea that on this evening, uh, one of the East German leaders, a man by the name of Gunter Schabowski, was asked uh, by uh, an Italian journalist uh, at this meeting uh, that they had had, a Politburo meeting, and he was basically talking in old fashioned communist jargon. He said, well, does that mean people are free to leave the country? And he had no idea what to say. And he basically said, uh, yes, it does, uh, or words to that effect. And uh, people uh, rushed to one particular border crossing uh, the guards had no idea, and again, that was incredibly dangerous, um, but word went through, and there's some great films and uh, TV documentaries about it that re retell the story, um, and people started to, to go through. Liz says, <coughs> John, you always seem to be in the right place at the right sure. time for events. How do you manage it? And can we sandwich uh, that in with uh, the dismantling of the Soviet Union? Well, um, to Liz, I would say one of when I started my journalism career at Reuters, the little motto they always gave to me was he may be slow, but he's always wrong. So um, uh, so uh, it's not always the case. And I can tell you many examples where uh, I missed things or I wasn't in the place I wanted to be in or, or, or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, and so that leads me on to the uh, the Soviet Union. And goodness gracious, that was, uh, I'd been in Moscow as a trainee in the mid 80s. That was uh, Gorbachev uh, 
Glasnost, which was the opening up, and Perestroika, which was the economic liberalisation. It was also the time of Chernobyl and the nuclear disaster. Um, and uh, the office then, which was only five people, two, uh, it was reduced to three because of a spy swap in which Thatcher threw out some Russians and the Russians retaliated by throwing out um, Brits and that included journalists. So as a 23 year old intern, uh, I was sort of having to file these most extraordinary stories about Chernobyl. Um, and so fast forward to the early 90s and again, um, it was an incredible moment. I remember being in a small briefing, half a dozen journalists with the British ambassador at the time. And I, this was in um, 89, uh, sorry, in 91. And I said to him, uh, because of the question of was it the Soviet Union or was it the Russian Federation? It was a battle between Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the Soviet Union, Boris Yeltsin, who was the Russian Federation. This was before Yeltsin kicked him out on Christmas Day, uh, 1991. And the British ambassador said, I have no idea what country I'm, I'm, I'm ambassador to. Um, and that gave you a sense of the chaos. It was a time of incredible excitement and optimism. And I must say, I there's something visceral in what I feel about what has happened to Russia in the intervening times and what Putin has done for and to Russia. One could take the slightly miserable view, which is it's consistent with Russia's history and needs a strong leader and and, and all of that, all of which is, 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 is true to a degree. But something amazing was happening to the country at that time. The opening up was being embraced. And I find the defense of Putin, and one sees British politicians do it, one sees journalists, thought leaders, defending him. The person I liken him to is not some romantic Che Guevara, radical leftist leader. I, I equate him most to General Pinochet in Chile. Um, just an extremely dangerous uh, thug killer, the number of assassinations that have taken place within the country and outside the country, particularly journalists and lawyers and people trying to unearth facts and and defend people while at the same time siphoning off um a uh, very good book currently by uh, a woman called Catherine Belton um on Putin which really blows the lid um on uh, the uh the, the the mafia state the state organized kleptocracy along with uh draconian powers and the Salisbury poisoning says it's been a three part series finished yesterday. Many might have seen that. Um, I mean, that was rather inept, wasn't it, John? Uh, how could this all powerful, murdering, assassinating uh, megalomaniac have bungled that so badly? Well, I'm sure you believe those two uh, young men who said they just went there because they they'd heard all about Salisbury Cathedral and the spires. And that was it. surely. Yeah. Uh, 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 that was it. I, that was it. I, is he evil in the same way that Stalin was evil? Well, this brings me back to this 21st century authoritarians versus yeah. 20th century dictators uh, point. I mean, evil, that's for probably somebody of the cloth to to, to talk about rather than uh, a wizened old hack like myself. Um, I would. Um, so leaving leaving that aside, uh, he is, in in some ways, in his own terms, remarkably successful. He has brought stability of a sort to to Russia. The economy staggers on through. It's completely dependent on oil and gas. There has been no diversification of the economy. Uh, the commanding heights of the economy, the utilities, have basically all been stolen by. Uh, a couple of hundred people, the oligarchs working through the security system and the politicians and Putin himself, uh, who said to be worth 50 billion at the last count um, uh, US dollars. Um, so uh, in those terms, yes, he has been uh, successful. No, he doesn't go around, you know, there's been no mass uh, extermination of the kulaks, uh, peasant, you know, the, there's nothing like that at all. If this is the 21st century model, you're basically fine. You can go on a holiday, go skiing to Courchevel outside coronavirus time. You can go to the south of France. You can have your villa here. You can, 
as long as a you don't criticize him and b you make sure you pay off all the people at a regional and national level that want a slice of whatever money you have made let's go to the book by your left ear blair's wars which is uh where we first uh met each other uh john when you were writing that um tony blair now in history were those um uh, wars um, justified five wars in six years? So it was interesting when I wrote the book and uh, the book sort of evolved when I originally started to think about the book it, this was going to be a rather dry analysis of uh, Tony Blair's foreign policy then the road to Iraq happened and uh, he, initially he wasn't particularly interested in foreign policy um, the uh, he had gone along with George Bush uh, on Afghanistan and trying to uh, root out uh, Al Qaeda from Afghanistan and engineer regime change from there. He had entirely correctly worked with uh, Bill Clinton to uh, uh, deal with the, the Serbs backed by uh, the Russians in Kosovo. And don't forget, inaction can be as criminal as action. And I covered the massacres in Rwanda uh, and the inaction of the international community was abhorrent, as was the inaction of the Western community, uh, international community on uh, Bosnia. So I was with Blair uh, and he also, uh, the Brits got involved in Sierra Leone as well uh, to restore by force um, a largely uh, good regime uh, there. So Blair's actions prior to Iraq, I largely supported. Um, I was very close to Robin Cook, the then Foreign Secretary. Indeed, I had written a um, biography of him before and got to know him well. And he just walked me through the evidence base. And I got to talk to pretty much everybody in and around number 10 in the security services, um, in the foreign policy establishment um, and uh, I said to them I hope you recognize your contribution to this book but I hope nobody recognizes that it was yours uh, which is very similar to your approach Anthony and your and your brilliant uh, dissection of, of our uh, prime all our prime ministers warts and all um, and uh, the methodology of the book wasn't challenged it was uh, hardly complimentary to Blair on Iraq uh, he wouldn't talk to me for 10 years. He literally would blank me in, in rooms and receptions and things where I happened to be with him. To his great, great credit, he agreed to do uh, an interview with me on the 10th anniversary of the war for, for the BBC. And it was not just journalistically interesting. I think Blair is a fascinating psychological figure. Um, I mean, you've written extensively about him. You know him exceedingly well. My take on him is that he is uh, a, a, um, a really great, he was a really great prime minister, particularly when one compares him to everyone who has followed, including Gordon Brown. Um, Blair, I know, is racked by Iraq um, in a way that David Cameron I doubt has lost a moment of sleep over his uh, incredible failures on uh, Brexit. Um, and I remember Alistair Campbell was somebody with whom I crossed swords frequently, as I did with Peter Mandelson and others. I, the, the sort of thuggery around Blair in, in the hubristic period was unpleasant. Not nearly as unpleasant as some of the stuff now, but but pretty unpleasant. Um, and he said to me once, uh, in uh, future, when you look back at this time, you will ask yourself, why was I so perennially negative? And I, and I, I said to him, actually, that, that credit to him, because he's right. I do sometimes look back at the Blair era, leaving to one side my unambiguous, I think 99% of the public's unambiguous, um agreement that Iraq was a catastrophe and a terrible mistake um I think well-intentioned but 
just wrong in every respect, failure with a capital F, leaving that to one side, and some people won't leave it to one side, they say that's enough. But I think in, in all other ways, uh, he's an underestimated politician, and it is so sad that his interventions on so many issues now are disregarded or disparaged because of Iraq. Uh, a lot of questions here. We've got uh, Jo Cox, the an fourth anniversary of her uh, death um, uh, just uh, a day or two ago. Her sister is talking in this uh, series, um, uh, Kim Ledbetter. Um, questions coming up, John, about how we can heal the country, whatever side. There'll be people listening uh, here, and I'm sure um, this being a, a, a typical audience, you'll be 48.1% uh, for Remain and 519 uh, for Brexit. But, you know, we're one country. Um, what are your thoughts for bringing the country together and, and you know, being critical of Boris Johnson might be, or might not be necessary, but that's not going to help us through. Um, are we going to, be, how can we unite as a country again, is the main question. Yeah, and it's, and it's a vital question. Um, I, well, there's a lot of issues here and we probably don't have time to go into them in, in great detail. And just, I mean, I am somebody, <coughs> excuse me, of the of the classic sort of centre left, social democrat, call, call, call it what you will. And yet I have always intensely respected conservative MPs, politicians, uh, people who voted uh, or, or, or whatever. There is a range of political viewpoints that all healthy democracies uh, should embrace. I have never been tribal um, and I think a healthy democracy realises that governments have a term, their term and their time. They make mistakes, but they largely seek to do good. I do think, as I hope my introductory remarks demonstrate, there is something very different about the toxic populism. It's very different. It's not even, I mean, some of the politics of it is, is sort of red, you know, blue labour or whatever you want to call it, but it is toxic. It is anti-truth. It, it plays fast and loose with the facts. It is deliberately divisive. Look how, you know, what, there are all kinds of legitimate points of view on the Black Lives Matter debate, on um, the statues debate, uh, on not on police violence or anything like that, but on at what point do you erase history? Um, uh, is there only one point of view, uh, an acceptable point of view? No platforming. I'm sure your students have. I'm a great freedom of expression advocate. I believe that my views and the views of everybody are enhanced by being in the room with people who passionately argue the opposite. But I do think that there has to be an adherence to institutions, to constitutions, to rules, to norms, to facts that the people around Johnson and the people around Trump, basically his mentor, deliberately disregard. And so in deliberately, deliberately, it is an absolute, oh, of course, I mean, uh, again, the uh, I think the BBC has much to answer, and I've said this many times before, for its coverage of the referendum. I absolutely want um, all issues at all times to be rigorously debated, but they have to be based in facts, in fact checking. And uh, which brings me briefly on to the question of social media, which produces, which reinforces people in their views rather than allows them to focus on reasoned arguments to the contrary. And I would say, Anthony, to you, to your colleagues, to colleagues in higher education around uh, the country uh, and thought leaders uh, as you are, this is the absolute uh, root of um, the problem that there is such a tendency to uh, believe uh, words such as appropriate and acceptable, I have real issues with. Uh, views are not appropriate or acceptable. They may be your view, they may be my view. As long as they don't break the law, 
as long as they are not egregiously racist or offensive or whatever, there's no question of inadmissibility. They are legitimate views. And I think the healing to politicians of, of those extremes, the populists and the others, and Jeremy Corbyn, I think, was equally culpable in a different way. These ex extreme uh, divisive politicians have not invented the problem. The vehicle is being enhanced by social media. I cannot, I, I, I don't immediately have a solution, but it does lie in, in consensus building. And hopefully we will find politicians and uh, celebrities and national figures and thought leaders that will help produce this, this consensus, which it isn't necessarily soggy centrism, but it is a consensus. On the BBC and, and Brexit, we have Katia Adler, the uh, Europe uh, correspondent for the BBC, talking in the series in 12 days time. Question about Trump uh, and is Trump going to be, if he wins, is he going to win? The question, uh, is he going to win in November? Uh, and will he be able to heal uh, the United States or will Biden, if it is Biden, uh, if uh, he knocks out Trump? And how toxic could, is it going to become? Well, this is such a great uh, question, and I didn't use it in my remarks, but actually, uh, Lionel Barber uh, at the programme posited an absolutely apocalyptic uh, scenario. Before that, by the way, I think Cathy Adler is a, is a fabulous journalist. I think the problems with the with the Beeb and, and the, the Brexit campaign were here in the UK, and they were not challenging the battle buses and and the politicians of both sides, including George Osborne's um, doom laden scenarios as well. Um, on to Trump, the uh, the Barber scenario, which I've seen uh, being aired by by others, is that Trump is deliberately um, seeking to unleash mayhem in uh, America now. So. Uh, that either he can uh, make sure that his base votes and all he needs is his base, base to vote uh, with a high turnout, or uh, at least as ominously to create conditions where he could declare a state of emergency and prevent the elections from happening or to change the rules of the election so that it's, for example, postal voting, whatever. And um, we're both old enough to remember, well, the hanging chad debate when uh, the voting was disputed and had to go to the Supreme Court, the results in Florida, which gave George Bush victory over Al Gore in 2000. Um, this apocalyptic scenario would, would make sort of 2000 seem like small fry. Um, and there are some apocalyptic, you know, is Trump is not going to go quietly. And even if he loses, what would he do in the three months of transition? I'm not a great conspiracy theorist, but it's out there that that could happen. OK, two very quick final questions with uh, 60 seconds to go, so 20 seconds. Right. Each. One is, uh, can you absolutely guarantee that democracy is safe uh, in Britain and in um, uh, the United States in the next um, 25 years? And secondly, what can we do uh, to help uh, bring our country together? Well, democracy is not is not a, a single model. Uh, it, it's not a binary democracy or autocracy. Uh, a lot of freedoms uh, are in danger. Um, you can be a populist and an autocrat and still get elected. Uh, it's just the elections are are dubious. So in short, no, it is liberal democracy. Good, decent society is absolutely not guaranteed. The good news is that it's in our hands. And what was the second question, the final what question? What can we all do, uh, or the, the, the 1,200 listening, uh, <laughs> what can we do to help bind our country together? So whatever side of different divides we're on, we can share together and, and nurture each other and our democracy. Engage strongly and respectfully um, and seek out people that you vehemently disagree with on issues that you care most about and engage with them, talk to them, hear what they say, even if in the end you don't agree with them, you will have shored up democracy and debate. Wise, good advice there to conclude from John Kampfner. Tomorrow night we're going right inside the court of David Cameron, uh, which uh, John Kampfner was talking about there in those uh, six years with Kate Fall, who was the senior 
uh, female figure in the court of David Cameron, written a book called Gatekeeper, Cape Fall Tomorrow Evening. John Kampfner, a uh, bedazzling uh, intellectual uh, and global range of uh, an historical range of your comments too. Thank you very, very much indeed from all of us. Thank you, John Kampfner. Thank you.